Okay, welcome everyone to our February A to J Author new user webinar. This is Jessica Frank. I'm A to J Author's project manager. And um, this is kicking off the 2019 series. With me today um, on our staff panel is um, our executive director for Cali, John Mayer. Tobias and Hello. Oh, sorry. Uh, Tobias and Terejo, our A to J author uh, backend developer. And Mike Mitchell from Batovi, who does a lot of our um, programming. He's one of our consultants. So we are here today to talk about community feedback, to get um, some put to put some ideas that we have out there um, for the new LOI season that is starting soon and just the next uh, year to two years in A to J off the progression. We also want to hear from you about things that you like, that you want to see, or things that aren't working the way that you would expect them to. So a couple of notices. Um, we are going to be doing a code push this Monday, February 11th at 10.30 a.m. Central. We don't expect there to be very much downtime on the website, but we are fixing a repeat loop bug where repeat loops were, if they were incremented manually via logic, they weren't properly storing repeated values. So um, like I said, minimal downtime, and we will notify the list when we are finished um, as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me about that. But we'll be going forward on Monday. So I'm gonna jump right into community feedback and John, Mike, and Tobias, feel free to jump in anytime if you wanna expand on these. Um, what I'm gonna do now is show a couple of our ideas for the next year moving forward or things that we think would be really great enhancements to A to J author, and we wanna hear from you. So um, our team will also keep an eye on the chat. Um, team, please keep an eye on the chat uh, as we're going forward if you don't have a microphone to talk today. So the first one to talk about, John, um, do you want to take this one since it was kind of your idea? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, we're going to punt that one to John. <laughs> well, first of all, for all of these, um, these, aren't, these aren't things that we're uh, – they aren't necessarily things we're submitting LOIs for. Uh, some of these we already have um, uh, on the roadmap, um, or that we're planning to do. Or, but 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 this whole presentation is is uh, is part of an ongoing conversation about, you know, how do how do we do more with what we've got? You know, we we we've we've gotten to a particular plateau, which is to say, we have a a tool in A to J Author that does. Um, uh, Authoring of decision trees lets us. We, we, we've we're we're, on, we're we're very close to open sourcing it. We have a platform at a to j.org to host. You know how can we how can we use that as a starting point? You know rather than scratch, um, and and go further and farther and and, and all that. So this first idea is um, you all remember the if if you all remember the old a to j uh, author, it had a, a pretty cool mapper. Um, it uh, it was built in Flash, and there was, and Flash was built for, for those kind of um, uh, what do you call it, graphical uh, uh, interface type things. When we came into JavaScript, um, the tool, the tooling was a little bit less uh, uh, available or capable. Plus, building the mapper was was a, was a little bit of a tricky thing. Um, and we've always had this idea, even in old A to J author, that you know, maybe this interface, which is to say a picture of the flow chart, a picture of the decision tree, could be a more friendly interface for your beginning authors. Uh, and, and heck, even um, uh, uh, experienced authors. So the idea is, um, you know, any guided interview, we can automatically build the decision tree or the flow chart on the screen using a JavaScript library that, you know, creates directed graphs. Um, and, then I'll, and then make that a live or an active screen. So you could click on it and up would pop the question uh, uh, box that you can change information in. You could drag um, a line from one question to another and within the system it would know to say, you know, you wanna, you wanna make a button that uh, when clicked goes from one question to another. Um, you know, there, there's, this, this is a, for, for a lot of people, the visual realization of a decision tree is is the flow chart and so if they start building in this I can imagine that they like you know you draw you you create one you just draw a line you create another you draw a line you draw two lines out to show branching you could double click to to edit the uh, advanced logic to show complex branching you know all that sort of thing so that's that's the goal is to build one of these it's on our roadmap already 
but um, um, but it turns out when we, as we unpack this, there's a lot of uh, very interesting and small uh, user interface details that we have to work through. So we're hoping to see something you know in the next couple of months that we can show you. Um, but this is an opportunity to talk about any any uh, brainstorms that anybody has about you know how 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 whether they, whether they whether you think this is a good idea or not, and um, how you might like to see this implemented. Thanks, John. Hmm? Um, so again, if you have comments on this, feel free. Otherwise, we'll just um, keep going. Uh, so the the next idea we had has to do with modularization. So we're um, 2019 is. John, can you mute yourself? Okay. I'm getting it. Go. Sure. Thanks. Um, 2019 is the year of modularization for A to J author in general. We have a TIG working with our partners in North Carolina to break up the components of A to J author into the viewer by itself, author by itself, and the A to J dat by itself. So it'll make it easier for us when we open source it. It'll be easier to um, for people to host different components and for us to debug um, the different uh, parts of the software without having to work on the entire package as a whole. So that's sort of the idea where this came through. And it came through also with authors asking about copying different parts of an interview um, from one interview to the next or sharing different components. So the idea would be to allow authors to both share individual questions and to share whole steps. So if you particularly like the way that um, Illinois, for example, does their introductory screens where they have an explanation of the interview, sort of the I'm not your lawyer screen and here's all the things you're going to need to do. You could copy that chunk of an interview from some sort of shared repository into your own interview. If somebody had an individual question that they did a really great job with logic, for example, you could take that question um, from your own interviews or from other people's interviews, also in a shared repository, to um, use that in a new interview as well. So this is sort of the community building and also making it faster and easier for authors to build interviews when we already have all of the, the, the great examples in, um, in the community. So um, when I'm teaching law students how to make guided interviews, a lot of it's like, oh, go look at X state's example of their introduction. Look at how this, you know, down, go run the interview and look how they ask the name questions or ask about a repeat loop about children. Go look at those examples, but then the students have to manually recreate that or download the files and look at it in author and recreate it in their own account. And that takes time. And it's um, for new authors. Um, it's it would save them a lot of time of getting up to speed for some of the same automation that happens in every sort of interview. So our idea would be to have the ability to share internally and also then create a repository of shared components that all authors could access. Any um, discussion on whether um, the sharing should be sort of automatic. So if you compartmentalize or you make a component within your own interview, should automatically go into a shared repository, or should it be something that authors have to say they want to share um, among other authors? Is there any reason to keep sort of a private repository versus a public repository? Steve Simon is, uh, I raise his hand. Uh, he has a question, I was addressing it in the panel, ah. it's a separate one. Um, Steve, I'll get to your question at the end. Um, anyone have a comment then on the modularization? I, I do, um, and I and I almost hate to bring this up, but um, but I feel like I, I it, it it it's getting to the point where we have to, where as a community, we're going to need to address this. Um, who owns interviews? Um, right right now, the the terms of service on uh, on various websites might govern. Um, uh, the ability to share interview or the you know the presumption that if you create a guided interview and upload it to LHI or the A to J org then you're, you're basically making it available to people but the underlying intellectual property probably continues to belong to the author um, except where it's a work for hire under a grant or if you're working for as a consultant to to a legal aid organization or a court um, but and, and so if that's true, then then uh, I, well, let me let me just put it this way: we should probably make more explicit the 
the intellectual property rights of of the interviews themselves so that we can more openly share them without people having to ask this question you know have i have i just you know do you have permission to give me permission to make a copy of this and and so forth um and um, and and maybe this modularization uh is is a way to crack that open and say you know what license are you assigning to your work and and you know go get that cleared up before you share stuff with other people i mean right now we're we're, we're just doing it sort of like uh ad hoc and that's fine we're a, we're a close knit and a friendly community but i want to keep it that way <laughs> All right, I'm not seeing any other comments on it, so um, we can move on. As always, feel free at the, e at the end to have comments, or if you want to send us emails, if you don't feel like talking about it in front of the larger community, that's fine. You can also send us uh, feedback as well anytime during the year. So the third idea that we have is to create some sort of gender-neutral avatar. So right now, in the current production AOJ author, we have two end-user avatars. And we have um, the we have the younger male and the younger female um, that you can see in the first panel here on the left. Um, this year, likely in the next uh, month or so, we're going to be releasing um, an additional six avatars, including um, a younger person in a wheelchair, young, an older um, person, uh, both male and female, and then older in a wheelchair. And we're gonna let the end user pick their skin tone and hair color similar to what you can do as authors for the guide avatars. So this will break up right now the skin tone, whatever skin tone you choose for the author av or for the end, the guide avatar is the, set, the same for the end user's avatar. Um, so this will break that and allow um, the end users to choose whatever skin tone, whatever hair color they'd like and just pick an avatar. We tried to make it so that users can um, be more connected and feel more represented by the options available and so that we're not asking the gender question. What it's going to look like likely is we're going to have still the gender question um, in the interview and then if you want to use this new way of doing avatars you'll be able to select select that as a field type as well and it can replace um, your existing interviews, your existing asking the gender question if you don't actually need to know what their gender is. Someone comment. So there's still some. The author still has some. Uh, what's the word? Some some ability to uh, to include this or not include this in their guided interview. Yeah, that's what. Or it's, is this a feature? Go so, ahead. So it's not going to automatically replace the what is your gender question that currently sets the avatar. It's going to be a new field that authors can go in and add to their interviews or replace the what's your gender question. Um, so we didn't want to completely replace it automatically because there are some instances in which the court form does require the gender, the sex at birth, and the author is relying on our what's your gender question to set that variable on the form. And so we can't just completely er erase the old way of asking. This will just be an additional way that you can ask for it. So I'll just ask the question, what about gender pronouns and uh, asking the user which ones they might or might not want to use? So that is can be set by an um, an author in um, the the interview itself. Nothing about the what's your gender question automatically sets pronouns anywhere in an interview. Um, and there are a lot of times that there aren't you don't need a pronoun to be used in your interview at all. Right, because you ask because if you say if you refer back to the user who's filling out the guide interview, you mostly say you, which is a gender neutral pronoun. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, 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 so, and the gender pronouns come in when you refer to them in the third person, um, he, she, mm -hmm. him, her, um, which might come up in some other situation. But our, uh, I think we could, I think we have functions that can also deal with that. I mean, it's all a little not perfectly clear to me how, how, what, what the right way to do this and, and how to make the options so that it's easy for both the author to decide and the user to to decide. But but that's that's what this is, is is let's let's see if we can start figuring this out. Yep. So we've had requests beyond these new avatars that are going to be rolling out this year to inc to include some sort of gender gender neutral option. 
Um, and so that can be very tricky in terms of how do you make that avatar look. So we're looking for suggestions from, from you all in the community that can um, give us some ideas that we can go to our designers with, who, the one who came up with um, these new six new avatars, um, or a way to, we've heard, well, why don't you use Clippy or, or a teddy bear or um, some sort of non-human um, shape, but that's not really where the look of A to J is or um, sort of where our past history has been in terms of the avatars. And so um, any ideas that you have to make this as um, correct as possible and as smooth as possible in terms of uh, a new avatar, I'd love to hear um, because I'm, we're sort of stuck at a point on how do you make a gender neutral avatar? So um if you think that these eight options with the different skin tones and the hair colors would be fine, I'd love to hear that too. Or if you think we should keep pushing um, pushing the ball, I'd like to hear that as well. Yeah, we're doing, I mean, we're doing research and reading and, and, and talking um, to all kinds of communities about this. Um, but but there isn't, there is not broad consensus uh, on this. And so, uh, so as much input as possible, we, we fully expect to have to iterate on this. You know, um, get it wrong the first few times, or or not, you know, not get it perfect. But um, we feel it's it's uh, better to try than to uh, than to not. And then on the avatar um, idea, we've been asked numerous times, um, well, what about if I don't want the avatars at all? So a lot of cases it came up in that people didn't want to ask the gender question um, and get the avatars because of the. Um, lack of a gender neutral avatar. And so um, some people just don't like how the avatars look, which is fine. Um, so we, the idea we had was to create some sort of skinnable viewer, which would mean that the back end of the viewer, sort of the the um, strength of the interview or the, the viewer in its ability to play complex interviews and move and be mobile responsive, um, and handle all sorts of the, the back end stuff, the meat of your interview would stay the same, but the front end of the interview could look different to your end users. So you could have, for example, this is our um, our mobile viewer. You could just have what is the mobile viewer if you wanted an avatarless viewer, even on a big uh, screen, even on a computer. Whereas now it's mobile responsive, and so you get the desktop version, which has the avatars if you're on a bigger screen, and you get the mobile version if you get um, sort of smaller than an iPad, down to a phone size. So the idea would be that you could put, um, that the A to J viewer, you would have the option as an author to set it to be avatarless if you wanted in your interview when it was run by the end user. So that's sort of our idea there. And there, there's actually a lot more going on with, with this simple idea that, than, than first appears. So, so removing the avatar um, makes A to J uh, look just like a chatbot. It is a chatbot at that point. Um, uh, merely expanding the mobile interview, uh, mobile interface to the full screen, is probably uh, in insufficient. Um, there, there's there's things about layout and mobile that that you wouldn't do in a full screen in a desktop, and so 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 it's essentially another it's it's another uh, viewer instance. You know the buttons will have to be uh, smaller, or changed uh, some of the fonts and things like that. Um, uh, the, the second thing that, that this cracks open is um, the idea of using A to J author for uh, lawyers. So lawyers don't love the one question at a time thing. You know, if they're using it to fill out a form, you know, uh, which, which is why which is why Hot Docs is such a great. It's funny we're sort of like going back to uh, back to the future a little bit here. Um, you know, if we wanted to make our our, our our user interface more efficient for people who are already smart about what's going on, the law or the particular thing, then 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 maybe the maybe there's some subtle uh, changes to the design to the UI that that could be uh, wrapped in with this avatar avatar less sort of viewer, um, because one one of the things that's been a uh, what's the word I, I'll I'll just say it, a disappointment over the last uh, 10 or so years is that, um, you know, document automation doesn't seem, it, it's not clear that it's invaded the, the offices of uh, lawyers or it's not made uh, legal aid attorneys or uh, more efficient or they haven't, you know, we haven't been talking with them about exploring their workflows in that way. 
Now, a lot of that, it, it's okay because a lot of that has, has found its way into the uh, case management systems, um, uh, Kemp's legal server, PICA. Um, and so, and so there, you, can, you can create letters that pull the information right out of the case management system, the client information. You know, so, so, so some of that's, some of the pressure of, of, of doing that's been taken off there. Um, but this is another, that, but this sort of starts to creep up on that idea that uh, lawyer, what is a, what would the lawyer interface to, what is essentially a, an SRL interface tool look like? Thanks. Um, the next issue that, or the next idea that we had was um, the ability to co-author of gui uh, co-author guided interviews. So this is just a screenshot from Google Docs. Um, Tobias and I were co-editing um, ideas for this webinar, a spreadsheet about that. So the idea would be that, like Google Docs, you would be able to have the same interview open in two different um, users' accounts in A to J Author, and you could either give um, read-only permission to it, or you would be able to give the ability to edit, comment, or just view like um, Google Docs does. So this is particularly useful if you're working in groups of authors, if it's not just one author in the office doing the interview all the way through, but if instead you're working as a team um, on a specific set of interviews. You now there's a, a couple of legal aid organizations on today that work sort of in a group setting or share. One person does one component, one person does another. This is also big in with our students when we're teaching A to J author to law students in that they often don't work on one interview per person. Generally the class, if it's maybe eight people, they'll work in groups of two or groups of three on an interview. And right now they have to either share an account, which requires them to do some scheduling in order um, to make sure that they're not editing the same interview at the same time in the same account, or they have to share it like the old fashioned uh, download it, send email to someone, they upload it into their account, make the changes, and, and make sure that you're keeping a revision history going. Um, so this would be the um, adding, it would take a lot of work on the back end for us to add the ability to um, make sure that one user's account has permissions, so it's permissions on the back end, and making sure that the drafts are saving um, properly to the database but this was another idea that we had that we thought would be useful for authors on a bigger scale. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but this also, this opens up all, a whole vista of, of interesting ideas. Um, uh, even the, the, the example Jessica has on the screen, uh, it says, you know, last edit was made on January 18th. You know, think, think of a, Think of the ability to have a change log on a guided interview, sort of like what you see in GitHub, which is to say, you know, on this date at this time, this this version was created, you know, this question was added, this question was added, so on and so forth, with the idea even to uh, go back to any previous version. Obviously, that would be sort of like a backup system or a, or a, or a, or a version control system. You know, uh, how much do you want to, like, build into... A to J author itself, how much can you borrow from somebody else's system that already does that well, you know, maybe integrate directly into something like GitHub or GitLab um, instead of having to rebuild interfaces and tools yourself. The second thing is, it's not just like if there's a group of people or two people working on one guided interview. Um, think of it as a, a legal aid organization or a court or, or, or a law school has a sort of a person who who is the coordinator of all these projects. And so they they are added in as an author to all the student projects, or they are added in as the as the as the the, the person that does the the testing or the person who does the plain language checking or the person who will go through and, and make sure the law is up to date. Um, uh, you know, so you, so you can see a one-to-many sort of relationship between guided interviews, uh, groups of people who work on guided interviews. You might have a subject matter expert who's got a special knowledge about a particular um, uh, uh, gnarly area of law, you know, and you you don't want to you don't want to try to train her all up all the way in A to J author, um, and so you sort of create the the you you know the the experienced A to J author person creates the, the outline and then they just come in and um, and little notes have been left for them as to where so here's where we ask the question about 
um, you know, some some complicated legal issue. You know, please please draft something. You know, at these points, um, you know, as much as these things get more complicated or more involved or stretched out, uh, then then the the number of people with pinpoint expertise to make this work and the and 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 the ability of the tool to allow them to easily contribute their expertise becomes more more valuable more important um, and so that's what that's that's sort of what we're we're heading up on and Steve asks what happens now if two people using the same name and password open an interview at the same time so right now that would be sending different versions of essentially the truth to the server um, which could cause one to one person's changes to be overwritten like if you were at the z exact same moment making changes to the exact same interview um, it could cause uh, the what is the the ultimate interview file that is saved to be either only one person's or um, to be some weird combination of the two so whenever anyone asks about how to currently author um, as a group it is either have separate accounts and email back and forth the versions or to make sure that you are not both in the account at the same time um, so that the the truth on the server is correct to what you want it to be. The other idea, currently the A to J DAT, our document assembly tool, all templates output as uh, PDFs. You can start on, in a, um, an A to J DAT template either as um, a blank document, a, temp, a text template, and add elements to it, or you can start as uh, by uploading a PDF and automating on top of it, similar to Hot Docs Automator, PDF Automator. But the output is the same. The output is still a PDF document. So we've had talks about people who want to output to RTF, so that um, particularly that so that lawyers could do a review or make changes, like in a clinic setting or a low bono situation, pro bono situation where the end user starts the document and then is able to share it um, as a Word document or an RTF with their, their lawyer or somebody in the clinic helping them. Um, and so that's an idea. The, also, we had an idea that instead of trying to output to RTF into Microsoft Word, um, which a lot of people don't have anymore, to output to Google Docs, which is a free service that anybody could open um, with a free Gmail account. And so we have both of, both of those ideas are on the table as well. So this this cracks open a bigger a bigger thing as well. There's, it, it's interesting, right? We're we're at a point where we're we're bumping up against a lot of interesting ideas. Um, the 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 one the one here is that, as you all well know, um, uh, a form isn't 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 the the be all and end all. A filled out form isn't the be all and end all of a legal process, right? Um, even even the filling out of the form, if it's uh, sufficiently complicated. Um, you know, might require multiple visits by the user or multiple reviews by a <clears throat> by an attorney or by, by by somebody doing sort of a unbundled practice or limited uh, representation. Um, and the question is whether you bring them into a system to do that or whether you let the the system generate uh, content that can be taken out. And and what happens when somebody says well, I've looked at your document, but it needs the following changes, and and how then that comes back into the system, and those changes get uh, manifested. Um, the, all all difficult questions, but you know there are there are some underlying sort of directions um, we're heading. I'm trying to stay away from Microsoft Word and from locally installed software. Um, it's it's been the bane it's the bane of our existence in terms of um, Mac users with Word, it's the bane of our existence in terms of uh, versioning. Um, you know, people with Word 2013 versus 2016. Um, it's the bane of our existence with uh, converting. You know, when people have um, fonts or uh, other problems, and it's the bane of our existence with uh, malware as well. Because with Word, you can have um, uh, uh, VBA tools built into the system or built into a document. It's also a problem with redactions or with, um, you know, hiding comments and things like that. Um, you know, and I'm trying to, and, and if we if we don't, if we go to, if, if we start with the idea that the editing is going to be happening in the browser and we're going to stay in the browser, 
um, with allowed export points, you know, okay, I can pull this down into something else, but, but, but I can't go back up. Um, you know, it, it makes the technology a lot easier for, for us, for us to manage. At least that's my assumption at this point, you know, we're, we're always, um, um learning more about this. Thanks. All right. So we have three more ideas coming down the pipeline here. Um, before we open it up for general discussion. So this one is about OCR inputs to fields. So OCR is optical character recognition. So the idea would be that you would be able, or the end user would be able to upload a document, a court document to um, an A to J guide interview, and it would start to pre-fill in the fields for them. So you would, ha you as the author would have to do some sort of uh, designation of on the court form in which you're going to be asking, um, like if the guided interview is say an answer to a specific court form, and then you would know ahead of time as the author that the court form that they're going to get, that they're, the uh, person going to get in the mail is going to have these fields, the caption is going to contain the um, petitioner and the respondent's information, it's going to have the court, the court um, room they're supposed to go to, what, whatever the court case number is some sort of standardized um, form that everybody who uses the interview is going to get. Instead of asking the end user for all those data points in the interview and explaining, like, make sure to look on page three for this piece of information, or the, the case number can be found in the caption, which is on the first page in the top right-hand corner, all of that extra explaining where to get the data the end user ultimately needs to put in. If they were able instead to upload a document um, and have the system fill in a lot of the information for them or some of the information for them, it would go faster. All they would need to, do, the end user would need to do would be to verify the, that the information uploaded is correct. Um, and so this is one of the things we've talked about as a potential, this is sort of a little bit further out there. Um, but people have asked about the ability to upload documents to A to J and attach them to their interview. Um, and so that, that's where we're sort of thinking about making it easier for the end user to include supplemental documents and also to skip steps that can be even further automated than just automating the document itself. Okay, seeing no comments. Um, the se second to last idea we have here is to integrate um, SMS, email, and fax outputs or reminders that go with um, that are part of the document assembly process. So if you know your end user is going to need to do X steps after they um, complete their document, like they're going to need to get it notarized, it's going to need to be three copies, they're going to need to share, um, give it to the sheriff to have it served, you can include built-in um, reminders that would trigger when the end user um, once they ran through the viewer, completed their document, then it would trigger in the system to send out um, in five days, send a, um, a text message reminder or send an email reminder or even fax. Um, that's sort of an outdated model, but still used a lot in law firms. Um, and so that would be the idea to integrate some sort of ability for your end user to get further follow up information after they've left the interview. Is this something anyone would be interested in having in their interview or? Um, not really worthwhile, move on. You can do it with other, with your case management system or something like that. Okay. Um, again, feel free to reach out after with any comments you have. Our final idea um, goes sort of with John's discussion earlier about how the um, avatarless interface is already sort of a chat bot. But the integration of A to J guided interviews with their, they already are expert systems in that they have complex branching um, and conditional branching based on the user's answers. All of that knowledge and that branching and the decision trees that are already exist in a guided interview could be exported to a, some chatbot service like Facebook Messenger. Um, so either it's integrated into the system automatically, like someone could access the same interview um, on the desktop version, the mobile version, or the Facebook Messenger version, or exporting to those to those tools like a, a chatbot or a Facebook Messenger, and um, that would be a unique instance of the interview. 
um, itself, which could be customized a little bit and added on to. Um, but essentially, the, the question and answer that's built into A to J is fairly easy, not fairly easy to break out, but the logic behind it and the structure behind it lend itself to either chatbots, Facebook Messenger, even if you think so far as um, Siri or Alexa or Google Home um, integration as well. Okay, so now this part is where we want to hear from you. Um, you can type it into the chat box um, or the question section and we'll keep an eye out. We'll unmute you if you want. Um, I'll go back and we had a question from earlier from Steve. Um, as a developer, he would really appreciate if we could fix the A to J6 memory crashing, which results in having to clear the cache and restart. Um, it happens way too often in too many interviews. So um, Steve, if you wouldn't mind, I. I can unmute you if you want to talk about this or um, we do we did release a new version of the browser in December. Our last code push was December uh, 7th or December 3rd. Um, and that version um, allowed for up to 500 interview pages. We had um, a problem where we only had a hundred. You could only run 100 different pages in an interview before it froze up. And so we increased that limit to 500. So that would be in preview or in the interview itself in uh, the viewer, you wouldn't run into any kind of memory crashing there. And we also do have a, a, a ticket in the system for handling when um, variables, if you're moving between interviews, um, if you're bouncing around between two different interviews, A to J, though the browser caches the variables from the first interview and doesn't necessarily uh, always recognize the variables in the second interview as being there, even when they are. So we have some browser caching, um, cache busting um, bug or um, feature add in the process um, in the queue. But um, I'll unmute you if you want to talk about it further. All right, Steve, you're unmuted. I didn't know I was talking today. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if the, if it's uh, all right. Okay, my my issue is that as a developer. If, if, for example, I have a typo in a computation and I test it, it just, you know, clobbers me. Mm -hmm. And I got to restart everything. It'd be nice if it would just, you know, let me, it stop and let me re edit it. Okay. So when you're, it's when the lot, like something is wrong in the logic, it fails and like it can't find that question or um, it can't branch and it freezes it up. It does, yeah. It doesn't go anywhere or somewhere. Yeah. Some, some issue that, that you know, I created my own bug, but it but it locks up and it takes for you know too much time to clean it up. Yeah, totally understandable. Um, on the logic side of it, um, we do also ha we have had we've had talks um, with Mike and Tobias and I about ways to make logic easier for authors. So sort of the A to J four vibe in that you could um, you didn't have to remember exactly the question name. So you were less likely to make some typo errors or forget a space in a question name um, or a variable name, that kind of thing. And so we're we're talking about ways to make logic um, sort of uh, autofill some of those parts, if possible, um, because it's a blank. It's just an open text box for the logic. It's going to take some sort of um, like a, a code, like a, a colon before you start typing a variable or when you put the bracket in, it'll, it'll trigger that variable search. Um, so we do have something in the works to make logic easier that would make um, less errors possible. So that might help a little. But I get your point about the, the browser um, or about it freezing uh, when you make a mistake. So, thank you. And not just freezing, but for example, uh, and one that I'm working on right now, uh, I have a, a, a logic branch, but it goes maybe through 10 pages if it doesn't apply on those individual pages. And then when it locks up, it doesn't tell you where the error is. It could be any number of those pages could have caused it to crash, but you don't know. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, better error messaging is also um, on our, our feature list as well. So I hear you um, and thank you for that feedback. Well, thank you. <laughs> Hey, Steve, this is Mike Mitchell, the, one of the developers. Um, uh, if there's any time that you do catch an error and you like see like this is a reproducible typo type situation, anything that's specific that you can send to Jessica 
would help me a lot in figuring out ways to control those crashes and, and to fail um, more elegantly than just locking up the whole system. I know it's hard when it does crash and you don't know where the error is, but if you happen to catch something that's sort of repeatable, if you could give me those scenarios, that would be very helpful as well. Thanks, Mike. You ask for it, you'll get it. <laughs> All right. I know, I know. <laughs> Um, any other feedback or ideas, things that aren't working the way you want them to, or ways you can make A to J easier for you as authors to work with? Um, we're always open to partnering um, in the LOI season. Uh, not, we'll mention that it is LOI season. Um, those are due in March. So if you are interested in um, partnering with us either to add an enhancement to A to J author, or we highly suggest, uh, highly recommend that you even put in TIG. Um, applications for doing more document assembly projects. At the LSC um, Innovations and Technology Conference in January, um, Jim Sandman was talking about like a back to basics. And I've heard that um, that they are looking for um, legal aids to, to want to do more document assembly projects. So if, it, if there's a queue of documents that you'd want to be automated, um, reach out to us. We might be able to help you either find a developer or partner with you or to let you know sort of, or to help you with the LOI process. I've written several of the um, LOIs with our partners, and so I'm happy to help in that if you've never done it. So my email's on here if you do wanna reach out and contact us. So um, if there are any last minute questions, anyone on the team have a last minute thing they wanna say? There's always, you can always email us anytime you want about ideas. Um, ha happy to happy to have a conversation about this. Um, it's your it's your project as well as ours. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you all for bearing with us for this longer than usual A to J author new user webinar. Um, the next webinar will be the first Thursday in March at 11 a.m. Central. Um, and as always, feel free to reach out. So thank you all for attending. Bye, y'all.